All right. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Nipuni Silva, and I'm joined by Robert Smeet and Das Sridharan, and we're coming to you live from Australia. As the human race accelerates to inhabit a new planet, the world is struck down by an unexpected pandemic. One might think they have nothing in common, but there is something that we can all learn. To set the context, we haven't even discovered the very corners and depths of our own planet and yet have started, have started thinking about discovering and inhabiting another planet. But there are substantial benefits to Earth by focusing in this astronomical direction. As an example, the rapid advancement of technology such as AI, the rise of practices for sustainable living and sustainable resource usage could cater for elements of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Holistically, this could mean an increased level of satisfaction for the entire human race. However, it's not going to be easy making this Martian dream come to fruition because there's still a lot we don't understand about space, about space travel, and about inhabiting another planet. To get there, we'll need to overcome four challenges. The first is that we'll need to escape the Earth's gravity. The second is that the distance between Mars and Earth vary due to their different orbits. And at the closest point in time, they will be approximately 482 million kilometers apart. That is an exceptionally large distance to overcome and the best opportunity to do so only comes around every 26 months. The third is that you aren't going to be able to launch when we're at the closest point to Mars. You'll have to launch ahead of time. And undershooting and overshooting will result in fuel consumption and increased time to destination. What this means is that there's a large room for error and a very limited opportunity to get it right. The last is arguably the most complex situation to call out. Getting to Mars isn't going to be a road trip. It's not a trip to the US from Australia. It is a journey of approximately seven months, if not more. But can you imagine being stuck inside for seven months? You can't walk outside to get some fresh air. You can't change your view. You can't visit your family or friends. Not even sure how Zoom would work with the communication delays. Um, you can't visit the shops, nor can you shop online. And you, know, you also have a limited amount of space to move around in. Whilst you're not so much socially isolated, you are stuck with the same people you jumped on board with. And it's not gonna disappear once you get there either. You'll be the first settlers on Mars, millions of kilometers away from Earth. You and your crew with an entire planet to yourselves. And not just for another couple of months. It'll most likely be quite a period after that until the next crew can join you and the next. And then there's also the possibility that once you take off, there's a no return policy, at least not for several years. So you're not gonna be able to see your friends, your family for a while, if not ever again. Has the gravity of the isolation and loneliness hit you yet? You begin to imagine how tough it's actually going to be. But going back to the list that you can see on your screen right now, does some of the items on that list sound familiar to you? On Wednesday, 25th of March, 2020, Australia went into lockdown off the back of what we now know as COVID-19. And we weren't the only ones, most of Earth did. One and a half years on, the human race is still suffering through one of the worst pandemics in quite a while. If you're from Buenos Aires, Dublin or Melbourne, where I am right now, we've been in lockdown for more than seven months. We would have made it to Mars. Luckily, we've advanced considerably by the way of technological services to mitigate some of the impacts. But I will bring you back to the concept brought out by Challenge 4 in relation to our seven month journey to Mars and that a lot of us experienced during the lockdowns. Isolation. We are literally living in a small scale version of what the future astronauts and cosmonauts will be facing as they embark on their journey to Mars. Whilst this is having a positive effect in slowing down or stopping the rate of infection locally, it is having a negative effect mentally on us. We feel lonely when we're not around others and virtually seeing someone is just not the same. 
And it all just becomes this perfect concoction for anxiety, depression, and other mental illnesses to arise. And it has been rising. Lifeline, Australia's suicide helpline, has been receiving calls every 30 seconds since we first went into lockdown. But what we're having to go through is an invaluable experience for us. Not entirely positive, but not entirely negative either. So what can we take away from our experience with COVID-19 and our learnings from living in a world where we are confined and locked away? Well, firstly, we've learned to and are getting better at working in a virtual world and have a firm understanding of when and when and where, ex where the exceptions apply, sorry. Um, the second is that COVID-19 has brought forth an increased awareness of mental health in society and its importance. This can be seen by me just messages shared by Australian local state governments and funding boosts that have been um, occurring in the mental health industry. At a more individual level, we're learning new ways to reach out and, and keep in contact with people and to engage with technology regardless of whether we grew up with it or not. We have learned that we, as social creatures, can survive and thrive in social isolation. And lastly, we're learning the importance of setting limits with technology and the need to sometimes step away for a bit and find new ways to occupy ourselves. I mean, who hasn't gone out and bought a new yoga bat or a games console or have started to learn or grow a new skill? Who started exercising or realized the benefits of a brief walk? Activities that engage us either mentally or physically that help fill in the gaps left by our social isolation and gives us the opportunity to do more than just stare at a screen. What's an even bigger takeaway from all of these points is that any one of these falling flat or decreasing can impact someone's overall mental state. So how could these play a role in a Martian mission? We know that astronauts and cosmonauts will be in isolation for their trip to Mars and for the period of their stay. That while they have their day-to-day -day tasks and experiments, they'll also need to maintain their mental well-being. And the way they can do that is by taking points of inspiration from these COVID isolation lessons. With that, we're gonna change the scenario a little to look at mental well-being and psychology from another perspective. To do that, I'm gonna pass it over to Robert. Thanks, Mpuni. Hi, everyone. I'd like to start off by saying I don't have a psychology degree or anything like that, but I am speaking from having dealt with sports psychology myself from playing sports at the highest level, specifically tennis. So coming from a professional sports background, a player often finds themselves in a highly stressful and competitive environment where they need to control their emotions and thought process if they want to continually think clearly and perform at the highest level that they are capable of. Now what causes stress? Stress levels can be caused through various reasons, such as uncertainty, pressure, expectation, unknowns, limited experience or exposure, and many more things. Playing sports at the highest level involves high stakes. Depending on the sport, there is limited or no coaching allowed. On top of that, a player is often out there by themselves, unless involved in the team sport. This means the person's next steps, thought process, strategic plays and mental strength come down to that person alone. It will be terribly similar or even intensified for anyone attempting to travel to Mars as, the, as these would involve much higher stakes. Yes, when going to Mars, they might be part of a crew, but it's most likely they will be experts in their field. So key decisions within that field of expertise are going to come down to them alone. High stakes, Pressure situations and life-changing decisions are not for the faint-hearted. It takes a special type of character. In sport, if the player does not perform to the best of their capabilities, they might lose a match and therefore not get the rewards they are playing for. Or if something goes wrong in the match, they might injure themselves. Losing hurts and obviously no one likes losing. But if you look at it from another perspective, a journey to Mars, however, involves much higher stakes. If something were to go wrong at any point on the Mars mission, well, that might be the end. Because of this, the high stakes, stress levels, and mental capability will be much higher and it have much more to lose. 
So how can someone cope with stress levels and how can they learn to improve in these areas? Well, in sport, and I'm using tennis as an example, because again, I've come from a tennis background, a player trains day in, day out with the hope that they improve one step at a time. Unfortunately, training alone is not enough to improve their skills and resilience, dealing with stressful and challenging situations, as well as training on the practice court. It's kind of counted as a safe to fail environment. So you need to look to do something else as well. Learning to cope with stress that players get from real life matches or tournaments, tennis player try to emulate real matches or tournaments through various ways. Now this can, be done, this can be done in various ways. It can be done through playing points on the practice court or playing practice matches. And you try and do that with as often as possible with as many people as possible as well. And therefore you have different opponents. You can experience different kind of scenarios seeing obviously no one plays the same way and no match starts and it finishes the same way. Once you feel like you're ready to start playing some real tournaments, you would normally start locally and try and work your way up to the world stage where you would play the bigger tournaments. And essentially the bigger tournaments you play, obviously it become much higher stakes, right? The world is watching, many more people are interested in it and therefore to be able to control your emotions and stress levels effectively, well, that's obviously gonna be very challenging. So by emulating a similar environment to playing tournaments, when something is on the line, it in turn gives the athletes experience in stressful situations, including learning how to deal with playing against different playing styles, game tempos, and other challenges that come with the different scenarios it presents. Ultimately, everyone has a breaking point where they go from being in control of their decisions and staying calm and collected to hitting that breaking point where less than optimal decisions are made. The ones who have trained for these situations in real life scenarios will be much stronger and much more viable candidates to cope with the challenges and pressures that come than others than that will come in the journey to, um, for going to Mars. Now, I'd like to hand over to my colleague Darshan who will talk more about training for Mars. Thanks, Robert. So I, I guess the reality is no matter how much you wanna leave the planet, maybe not everyone will be able to. This paradigm is changing as you would have seen a, a few days ago as well. Not everyone has what it takes at the immediate component or immediate stage. And so that becomes a hampering uh, in terms of our ability to leave. Going to the Kármán line, going to the moon, going to the Mars, they all have different risk exposures. And if you are the fortunate few that can, it doesn't mean that you may be able to go as far as possible in terms of Mars. You may actually still be constrained in terms of where you can get to. So the best that we can do to face this reality is to give our astronauts and cosmonauts and all the other exonauts the best chance we can to try to prove themselves on an Earth-based or at least a simulated environment. To allow for this, we would have to put them through multiple training and test scenarios and effectively emulate the worst of the worst conditions, given the fact that training for the best conditions may not always prepare you uh, adequately. And this also makes sure that we have selected the right people and they have the right understanding of what they are actually heading into. It's not really a, a video game anymore. So what does this actually look like? Well, we, we believe we can split this into two components. You've got the ground-based ground Mars training, which is all about training with what we have on Earth. And then you've got space-based Mars training, which could be around uh, deploying yourself on the moon for X, an X period or on the ISS. And so you become accustomed to the, the conditions that are out of this world. The ground-based Mars training would have all the training that current astronauts go through today, but expanded to make the ground space isolation training mandatory for a period. So essentially what the analog missions today try to emulate. And this is something that is being looked at by NASA at the moment as well, with their ambitions to, to emulate an, a Mars specific analog mission as well. But at the same time, you've got opportunities such as Antarctica where you are isolated that you can experience these similarities, not, not only with condition and isolation, but also terrain, temperature, and other, um, other con concerning situations. And these are also things that we can adapt specifically for isolation. For example, we've been locked in our houses for the last few months, kind of we are experiencing the same kind of situation. And then you've got the, the Gobi Desert situations, which also Im uh, emulate um, what Mars may look like. Once you go through these ground-based Mars training, the second component would be, let's, let's do it in a, a bit more closer real world atmosphere, which is the ISS or the moon. And depending on the duration of these minutes, uh, these 
these uh, initiatives, you may need to go there one or more times. But the best thing about this is you get the ability to adapt to these different environments, but also the traveling component. Going on a spaceship from A to B on Earth may not be practical, uh, but going to the moon in a spaceship will actually draw out the, the more of the isolation effects and the other effects that come. But we would need to mimic the frequency of what we would expect um, the traveling to be. What you end up at the end of these components is a potential list of uh, Mars-based astronauts between now and when we wish to lift off to Mars, whether that be 2026, 2030, or 2035, as an example. And effectively, we're able to then show, and they were able to show, their ability to successfully isolate for long periods of time, whether it be on Earth or in space. Not only that, it's also proving that you're physically and mentally strong. And whilst this doesn't guarantee that you'll be all right going to Mars, it does give you the best confidence and a reasonable amount of, I guess, trust in yourself that you can do it, you, you are capable. Um, and it's probably the best way to really energize yourself to get ready for this. The increased missions also over time. So the first astronauts that go across to Mars will be going across with relatively simple or uh, a reduced set of data points, which does become problematic. But as we get more and more um, missions happening, this lack of data points will actually dissipate. We'll get more, more and more confident with what we need to do. So when it comes to well-being of astronauts, NASA does have some programs in place. They have psychologists and psychiatrists for astronauts during their space missions, pre and post as well with psychological conferences uh, with medical staff as well. There also exist services that help educate uh, and provide information in terms of what they will be going through, what they may go through, and the worst case scenarios, not only for themselves, but also for their families. However, these are currently tailored towards a small group of people, and these are the highly skilled. And these are around the, the journey of isolation on spaceships, ranging for a couple of hours to a couple more days. The Inspiration4 missions, the Blue Origin missions, even the Virgin Galactic missions are a highlight of the differing, differing levels of um, variety that may be um, coming through. Specifically for the Mars-based astronauts, these circumstances become a bit more beyond what we face today. And so the programs that need, we need to put in place need to really encompass those extreme circumstances. Because I'm not always sure that sending doctors or a full team of doctors will be viable in the first instance. So we need to be, we need to be mindful of that. But we also need to be mindful of everyone that is connected to the astronaut, be it family, fr friends, relatives. There's also that element of isolation that hits them. Taking our lessons from COVID-19, there's also going to be activities that we need to do that really, really strengthen that mental well-being. And it is kind of this, this softer side or the softer risk that becomes quite important. And for those that head to the ISS, they might be taking personal items or photographs that might help them, but it is a, a shorter stay than what it may be going forward. Having said that, astronauts have stayed in the ISS for six months. The journey to Mars will also need to consider these, but a lot more planning and rigorous planning. There's a need for plans and tools and ability for crew to engage in different activities, because doing the same activities over and over and over again may not also help with that isolation factor. And the solution may not be a tablet either. For example, you don't have YouTube uh, readily available. Uh, after all, seven months, you need to figure out a variety of different things. And once they land, you need to keep physically active, and preferably, again, not doing the same thing over and over again or having to revert back to your spacecraft. So it introduces a new paradigm and a new set of principles you need to abide by going forward. Maybe it's using a 3D printer to print a basketball hoop. The final aspect is that social connectedness. We've struggled with this over the last couple of months, and I'm not sure that there's anyone that's going to say they have mastered it. It has been a difficult, difficult couple of months not knowing what communications technology exists while we're going to Mars and how we can communicate is going to be quite a big uh, bit, bit of a challenge. So bringing that all together, isolation as it relates to COVID-19 is something that we can overcome, but that's also because we have the tools and we've got the accessibility to the right resources, the right people at the right time. Not to say this won't be available going to Mars, but the first few missions may not have this ability to to be as robust and strengthened as um, you would require. We can learn, we, we have learned, we have adapted to life on Earth. And as the world comes out of COVID, there's a whole bunch of different learnings that can be applied, not only to future pandemics, but for these scenarios, especially long duration missions. 
And so if we take our lessons from COVID-19, from sports, from all different data points, we can coalesce them to help develop a program that is actually the best way forward and prove to ourselves and prove to themselves that they can be the, the next generation to, to go into a new planet and effectively beyond Mars. And as, as these endeavors become more prominent, the sense of isolation will begin to dissipate, but I guess you're gonna need more and more missions that go. And so the first guys, the second, third, fourth may not be in the best state, but the 10th, the 11th, the 12th may actually be able to, to cope a lot better than the first few. And just like we went on to the moon, the pioneers will be the ones that help the expansion of the human race, whether it be through COVID-19 or something else, but to quote Neil Armstrong, it is something that we need to do to, to go forward. And to that end, that's, that's mainly our presentation, talking about the, the psychological effects that come off the back of COVID-19 from sports, but so specifically how these can help tailor our programs going forward, especially as we, we face the challenges going through to Mars. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have any questions? They can go ahead and type it in the chat or just uh, raise your hand and, and uh, we'll let you speak since there's so few of us. Uh, go ahead, uh, George, Is that, did I say that right? Uh, thank you very much. That, it has been a great uh, conference, but tell me a little bit more about to manage the stress in that environment. Neprini, I might hand over to you. Sorry, can you just repeat the last bit, managing? Suppose you have a, a crisis and someone is thinking su in suicide, something something very bad. What can you make to, to solve that problem in, in a very far away environment? Um, in terms of from a mental well-being perspective? Um, yes, and many other big views that that you can have. I'd be able to look at it from a mental well-being perspective because that was the focus. Um, but I guess the future programs, I guess no matter what training you put in, as kind of Robert kind of alluded to, you will have those breaking points um, at points where everything kind of just does go bad. Um, but I think we're talking about how future possible master missions do have a psychologist or a psychiatrist on board that could be there as a person to hopefully intervene before it even gets to that point. That's the idea of being that a, an astronaut or cosmonaut is monitored throughout their entire mission and duration of their stay so that we don't get to that point where they do actually um go to let, let me tell you something i was at, at the conference with the um, university of minnesota i think and they developed a system that used uh, machine learning to understand natural language and they they can detect in some instances when the people is taking is thinking in a bad way i think the, that, that kind of solution that, that, that will work but uh but sure, you you are we are right. It's a it's a very it's a very difficult environment. Many people could break. We are breaking right now in the this is isolation. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think just to add to that, <clears throat> obviously, per that training and the selection process, we try and also make sure, obviously, the correct people are selected to have a higher tolerance and higher threshold. But as you mentioned, George, obviously these things can happen. I think it's important to remember as well, you hopefully are not alone in that Mars mission, that it would be other people that would be joining as well. And therefore it should also be, you'd hope, a team effort to make sure you can help each other if need be. I agree. Have you done any research on kind of this, the crew size to help mitigate some of the isolation, you know, with SpaceX and Starship having a larger vehicle for Mars missions, we could potentially have a larger crew, but but I know there's also the yeah, to balance the risk of being so far away from Earth. Is there kind of a sweet spot for for crew size to help mitigate some of the isolation? So I've um I've I've read through a few things in the in the past, and 
I haven't seen minimum size crews, but I've seen the optimal and it's, um, it's using like Charles Darwin's theory around having a, a minimum set of people required to help populate going forward. And, and I guess the reason why that one springs to mind as, as a first hand is at the same time, I think the variety of the people going across uh, is also probably quite important. So uh, in our line of work, for example, Robert and myself, we deal with a lot of technology, but that's not to say that sending engineers is going to be the right mix either. So having more of those people centric people to, to use those terms is going to be quite important. And I guess I'm not a hundred percent sure on the numbers. So if Robert Nipruni, um, feel free to jump in as well, but I'd almost be considering that maybe the variety is a bigger factor than the number. But having said that, you don't want to be around the same four people for seven months. So that becomes a little bit challenging, but at the same time, you don't want to be overcrowded. Right. I, I think we need to work in the way we can detect points of break, uh, of uh, breaking, breaking points. We, we need to detect that on time because many fatalities could occur in these circumstances. Okay. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Um, so thank you uh, once again for the presentation. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Felicitaciones.